You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... World Anvil is a browser-based world-building platform designed for all world builders, writers and novelists, dungeon masters, game developers, and everyone else. World Anvil keeps your world setting safe and organized, helps you find your characters, locations, plots, timelines, and maps quickly and easily as you write. Then, if you choose, you can showcase your amazing world building to the world, beautifully and interactively, to keep your readers engaged. You can even use our professional tier to build your career selling access to behind-the-scenes content your readers will love and growing your community. Build your world setting in any genre with over 25 custom-built world-building templates, complete with prompts to inspire your creativity. Allow your readers to explore the public parts of your world in an innovative new way with interactive maps, timelines, and wiki-style articles. Give special access to co-authors, beta readers, customers, or patrons to see exclusive behind-the-scenes content. There's a free version to get started with, with all of the major features. Guild membership offers you a host of extra options, including comprehensive privacy settings, co-authors, presentation options, and so much more. Join our community of over 800,000 world builders, including professional authors, Take part in competitions and learn more about world building at this fantastic online community. Use the coupon code HANK to get 20% off all 6 and 12 month subscriptions. WorldAnvil.com. I'm a recent convert and I know you will be too. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where we bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Nancy Starr on the show with me today. She has a phenomenal new book. It's called Rules for Moving, and it's available everywhere now. It just released yesterday. Uh, Thanks for joining me today, Nancy. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I'm excited to have you. Uh, Nancy, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Okay, first memory. So. I always, I, I feel like I always wanted to be a writer that I did not ever imagine myself as anything else. And uh, I can tell you a story that I, I recently discovered something that now makes me really question that a little bit. Okay. Uh, so when I was in fifth grade, I, there was a girl who's, who took on this job of writing little biographies of everyone in the class. And now that I think back on that, that is, I would like to know more about her because that's weird. But she would write these things, these stories up about uh, each kid. Um, and, and you were really excited to get it. And it talked about your personality. And it ended with one um, thought about what best described you and what you were going to be when you grew up. And so in my memory, this girl, her name was Gail, she really got me really deeply. And she said I was going to be a writer. So I I just knew this. This was a fact of my life growing up. And it was kind of my proof to myself that I thought I always wanted to be a writer. But this kid in my class knew it even when I was in fifth grade. And uh, but so when I finished writing rules for moving and I was cleaning up the mess of my of my writer's room, my office, <laughs> I, I just had this, I saw this scrapbook that I made when I was in high school, because I'm a pack rat. And I was thinking about that letter. And I thought, what if I saved it? I wonder if I saved it. I probably didn't save it. But maybe I saved it. And I got this dusty old scrapbook out. And I found the letter. And she did not say I was going to be a writer. It was like hilarious to read this letter, uh, you know, written in cursive on blue line paper. And the word that she used to sum me up was dramatic. And I was going to be an actress. <laughs> oh, I was going to be amazing. an actress. Yeah. So 
you know, when I thought about that, I thought, of course, because how could she know that inside I knew I was going to be a writer? And uh, my mother had been in a community theater group in our neighborhood. So I was in the children's community theater group and my mother got like the star roles. So I got the star roles, but I really wasn't interested in being an actress, but I guess that's how she knew me. So <clears throat> what I take away from this is memories are not trustworthy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, we, we are in charge of shaping our own narrative, yes. so that's that's okay, too. Um, that's right. I, you know, I know a lot of writers who are uh, uh, frustrated actors or, um, you know, frustrated directors, or th there's something about writing that allows you to tap into a lot of the same things that, that acting does, but you're in control of the entire process, which I think is, uh, uh, which entices a lot of people, too. I think you're exactly right. There is something really wonderful in having this one space that you can control, even though while you're in it writing, you don't always necessarily feel like you're controlling it. Right, exactly. Um, is it true that you once wrote um, a story for a friend of yours on a roll of paper <laughs> towels? Yes, I'm so mad at her that she threw it away. Right. <laughs> so Or cleaned I, up I, a spill with it or so. I think she just I think she just did not was not as attached to it as uh, later in life as she was when she got it. So that was my high school best friend. Uh, got a lot of things that I've saved in that scrapbook that I told you about from her. And I did. I wrote her this this basically the story of our friendship and it was one of those incredible friendships that I don't know that people have in high school. We just had lots of fights and making up. And, you know, we picked boyfriends who were best friends so we could be together all the time. And I had a roll of paper towels on each square. I told a little memory and uh, I'm still friends with her and I tease her about it. And she she apologizes every time I bring it up. That is so funny. That's so funny. Um, Nancy, when when you grew up, got out of school, started um you know, forming a, a career and finding your place in the world. Where did you, where did you go to work? Right. So I wish I had had any idea of how to be a writer when I got out of college, but I had no idea of how to do that and pay rent. So, uh, I, I wanted, I thought the place that I should go there for was a publishing company. So I applied for jobs in publishing companies as editorial assistants. And those jobs were hard to come by. I, and this was through well, employment agencies. And there was a job listing. And the one thing I knew that I didn't want to be was a secretary. That's all I knew. So there was a job listed at a, at a New American Library, a publisher in the publicity department to be a publicity clerk. So I really didn't know what publicity was. And I, I didn't really know what a clerk was, but at least it wasn't a secretary. So I, I applied and got that job. And then I found out that I was basically the assistant to the secretary. And if I was lucky, I would get promoted to secretary. So that didn't work out. Um, but that was, you know, my first little entry into, into publishing. And I was very unhappy in that job. I did get promoted to secretary. That was no better. And then I just was, you know, kind of put all my feelers out to look for a job somewhere. And through some personal connections of somebody put me in touch with somebody, put me in touch with somebody else. I, I interviewed for a job as associate story editor at a movie company. And I didn't really know what that was. But it had the word story in it. So that was really great. And a movie company. So that was really great. And I did get that job. And I spent 10 years working in New York in the movie business. So that was a lot of fun. What uh, working in the movie business and seeing, um, uh, you know, other people's stories come, come to life on the screen and, and, and being immersed in that, did, did that kind of spark the storytelling thing in you again? Well, it, you know, of course, this it didn't ever hadn't gone out. So it sure. was just kind of on low burner. And I think in my, you know, in my 20s, I still was hoping that, you know, as would happen in a movie, someone it, with a position of power would notice that I was a great writer, even without seeing anything I'd ever written and just like pluck me out and tell me, you know, here's your job, here's a writing job for you. So that, of course, wasn't going to happen. But what I, uh, you know, I was exposed to so many stories because my job was really to look for material that could be adapted to movies, which meant read every book, you know, go to the theater as many times as, you know, in a week as you could stand. And also looking for movies that were looking for distributors. So I was so immersed in stories. And the two things that I, I will say about that is, number one, I realized how, um, 
people's time is so valuable and there are so many choices out there that anybody who wants you to read your book or see your movie, you better make it worth their while. You better have something to say in a way that no one else is going to say it. You know, don't waste people's time. And the other thing that I realized was that I didn't belong in the movie business because the the writer in the movie business, at least at that time, and I think it's different in television and limited series, but the writer was so low down on the in the food chain. And I was working for producers, and whenever I was in a meeting with a writer to try to convince them to do something, the writer was, I always thought the writer was right. And so I was always in this weird position of, you know, representing the producer's point of view and then thinking, but the producer's wrong. The writer's right. I I sided way too much with the writer. (laughs) So that wasn't good. And uh, but what was the hardest thing was it was like it, it was a great job. So how to leave a great job to become a writer when you don't know how that's going to go is a really hard thing. And it was kind of could be a trap in that way, a job like that. Um, so I kind of snuck out by when I, I was having a child and I decided, you know what, this is it. I I'm taking a maternity leave and I can just pursue this dream that I have and not go back to that great job. And that's what I did. And you, you, you wrote a, um, uh, a nonfiction book first, didn't you? <laughs> yes, I did. I wrote, it's a funny book to think about because it was about tipping and it's, uh, the internet was not what it is now. So if you were, I was traveling a lot in that job in the movie business to London, and I never knew what to tip, basically is how that book came to be written. And I had a friend who worked in publishing, and I said, could you please publish a book that will tell me what to tip when I'm traveling, because I don't know. And she actually sold the idea to her, to the editorial board at her company, and they said, who's going to write it? And she had no idea. So she proposed me, And uh, I was still working in the movie business, and I didn't really know anything about tipping, and it wasn't my dream to write a tipping book, but I did not feel like I could say no (laughs) to the chance to publish a book, period. Right. So I did, and I did a lot of research, and I still don't know what to tip, I'll have to say, but now I'm not shy to ask. I really don't know. Plus, there's the internet. Yay. (laughs) I, I don't mean to speak for you, but I can yeah. only imagine that, you know, with someone who had always wanted to write, wanted to tell stories, when someone, when you see that opportunity yeah. to do this, uh, it, it it had to feel like, you know, just getting the wheels greased and, you know, um, doing this thing has to be a bridge to what I really want to do. Was, was it that kind of feeling for you? It was. It was. It really was. I just feel like I can't want to be a writer and then say no to any, any opportunity. I can't, I just can't. And then the funny thing that happened with that book was probably three years after I wrote it, three or four years, uh, there was a funny series of events, which I won't like go into in detail now, but basically Oprah called someone from Oprah called to invite me on Oprah as an expert on tipping. And I had this (laughs) Same day where I was, of of course, once again, of course, I said yes. But if I didn't know anything about tipping before that, I three years later, I once again knew nothing. And I spent a a long day of trying to get over my fear of having to go on Oprah and talk about something I didn't know anything about. And I had maybe five conversations with producers that day, escalating conversations and producers. And as the day went by, I got more and more excited. You know, I started telling people and worrying about what am I going to wear and I have to pack my bag. I'm going to Chicago. And then at the end of the day, the first producer called back and said, oh, sorry, we found someone else. And oh. it was, but then I wrote a whole novel with a, where producers get murdered. It became a mystery <laughs> series based on that. So nothing is wasted in a writer's <laughs> life. <laughs> well, you, you followed up that uh, that nonfiction book on, on tipping with your first psychological thriller, Buried yeah. Lives. Um, yeah. Was this genre something... Um, that you always loved? What what, uh, what had you switch gears to, to this story? Well, my, first of all, I did love um, psychological suspense, though it wasn't didn't exist in quite the same way. Like yeah. uh, that book was a lot like kind of the genre of Gone Girl. But at the time, there was horror and there was mystery. But this was kind of in between. And it, I don't think it, there were bookstores quite knew where to shelve it, to be honest. But um I I picked that to write because I 
I wanted to write a book that I thought would have a shot at getting published because I was kind of still on my maternity leave. And I thought if I don't progress on, I'm going to go back to that job. Like I'm not going to, I don't, I don't have the confidence to spend five years trying to get a book published and, and not going back to that job. So I tried to pick a book that I thought would have some commercial appeal rather than a literary novel. And I had recently moved to the suburbs and I had a lot of kind of feelings of anxiety of being no longer in a job and now with a little child and in this strange neighborhood. And I just put port it all right in that novel. And uh, so that was really great. It worked out. Yeah. How long did it uh, take you to find a publisher and, and get that book out to the world? Longer than I, than I really feel like it did. Um, so it took me a while to find an agent and, but once I found the agent, it happened real pretty quickly. So, but I would say a couple of years. Gotcha. Um, and after that book, then the mystery series came, uh, that right. you talked about after Oprah. Yes. Um, what was, what was it like? Um, well, first off, did you know that that was going to be a series or was it just a, an, another story that kind of evolved into a series? So uh, how did that come about? Well, I was actually in the process of writing a novel that was going to be a more a more literary novel, and uh, and it was about a woman who had a brother who was mentally ill and homeless, and she was looking for him, and there was this great disparity in their lives because he was this very troubled, mentally ill sibling, and she had this kind of fancy job as a talk show producer. So I was about probably eighty to a hundred pages into that novel when the whole Oprah thing happened. And I just was kind of, it, it literally changed overnight. It's like, okay, I have this character who's a talk show producer. I, the novel hadn't yet gelled. And I just took this left turn and decided I'm going to write a mystery in which talk, talk show producers are killed all over town. And it's going to be funny and it's going to be a mystery and I'm going to really have fun writing it. And I, I just, this is not unusual, these left turns. <laughs> There's a kind of a, a pattern here. Um, and, and at the time you could only sell those mysteries as series. So that's why it became a series, but I, I wrote it as a, as a one-off book. Um, and I had made an age, a change in agents, had a new agent and she said, I can sell this as a series. So that's, that's how it went. You said, um, uh, you mentioned, um, uh, that, that there was, uh, funny elements, um, about the yeah. series. There's, that there's something really great that goes hand in hand with mystery and a little bit of not necessarily lightheartedness, but, but maybe gallows humor. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think those two things go hand in hand? I don't know, but I do my, I find myself, and I don't know if you feel the same way attracted to that mix of comic yes. and dark darkness. I just find that really appealing and, uh, kind of, I guess it lets the tension take, a, you know, takes away from the tension for a moment. And uh, yeah, I'm definitely attracted to that. Yeah, for sure. Um, you, uh, you went on to write Sisters 1, 2, 3. Um, was that after the mystery series? It was, but there was one novel in between that, which is a book called Carpool Diem, which was a kind of a satire about the crazy world of youth sports and life in the suburbs and how helicopter parents, all of that stuff. And, was, uh, was yeah. this another reflection of, of your, um, your experience in the suburbs? I hate to, I hate to admit it, but, uh, I did spend a lot of time. I did not consider myself a soccer mom. If you called me a soccer mom, I would have been very insulted, Yeah, which was wrong because that's what I was. But I did have two kids that were in, you know, youth soccer. And there were some coaches that I heard about who were, you know, in the same way that teachers can be either wonderful, they can do, they can really inspire kids or they can just damage them. And so can parents and so can coaches and whether it's dance or soccer, whatever it is, I just saw that there was a lot of power that, that, that these figures had in the kids' lives and, and the parents seemed to be just handing over their kids and, you know, to watch their kids succeed no matter at, at what cost. So I was kind of looking at something serious, but again, through a comic lens. Right, right. With the with sisters one two three, I, I think a lot of our listeners are are familiar with this book and uh, and um, maybe associate you with this story. Um, 
um, so far. Uh, this this book had you kind of return to a, a bit of the the more psychological suspense and a, and a darker look at family relationships. Where did this story come from? I think that with Sisters 1, 2, 3 and also with Rules for Moving Now, it's kind of, I finally um, kind of settled into my subject, which is about the mysteries of all of our families and how we do if, if you tell me that there's a family where everything's perfect, I just I wouldn't believe you. So I'm always interested in how families keep secrets, are silent, um, and and I I think that that book began with this idea of this of this character who was the main character of that book who was in relationship both to her a very kind of colorful and difficult mother, and also at a point where her only child, her daughter, was also being difficult and and wanting to leave home and it's and the book is a novel is a lot about letting go and I don't even know that I realized how much that novel was about letting go until one of my own kids said that you just wrote a novel about letting go and I was like oh yeah I did (laughs) (laughs) um you know a lot of the the great um psychological suspense novels over the last several years have been women-centric and and written by women Mm-hmm. Um, and telling uh, these stories that are a bit unnerving, but mm-hmm. we all can relate to them in, in some way. Um, why do you think there's such a hunger for these types of stories uh, in the marketplace now? I just guess that, you know, we all have, many of us, most people have uh, just kind of generalized anxiety about our place in the world and how that, you know, what, what will our futures be? And is there a place where we can kind of experience those feelings in a safe place? I mean, that's always what novels give you, whether they're you know, romances or tear jerkers or, or psychological suspense novels, a place to safely experience your emotions. And you could pop out and, you know, lift up your head and say, okay, you know, onwards on my day. Right. The new book, Rules for Moving, um, let me tell you, this, this book um, is, is one of those books that leaves you thinking when you close that back cover and, and these characters stay with you. Um, tell me about Lane Meckler. Um, who is she? And um, she's an advice columnist, but how did, you, um, how did she come to you? She was, when I started this novel, uh, it was... This no, the novel set in three different places. It starts out in New York City. The next part is in um, New Jersey. The third part is on the island of Martha's Vineyard, where two of those places were, were places that Sisters 1, 2, 3 was set. And when I started the novel, it was all set on Martha's Vineyard and Lane. And uh, there's a character, Nathan, who she meets now in the second part of the novel, were coming together on that island. And they both had pasts. They both had been previously married. Lane had a son. Uh, Nathan had left behind a first family of his own. And I just kept being really interested in what happened before. So the, the kind of time frame of where the story started kept moving backwards until that part that what was the whole novel became just the last part of the novel. And I, she, Lane was a person who I conceived of uh, initially. I, I, the advice column, advice columnists, I don't know, I find them so fascinating. I wrote to one when I was 13 years old. I've always felt like that there's something so appealing about that confident voice, a stranger with a confident voice telling you what to do. I really love that. But I just thought it would be really interesting to look at somebody who was like that when they were in their job, but felt totally as useless as everyone else in in their regular life. And for Lane, even more than everyone else, she's a real she really feels like an outsider everywhere else. And she has this one place where she's super confident and at ease. But the minute she steps away, she just feels like everybody else knows the rules and she doesn't. And I don't know. I've, I don't know about you. I feel like I know a lot of people like that. And I'm probably a little bit like that where in your job or in one part of your life, you're, you're really where you're at ease and you know you're good at what you do. And but it doesn't necessarily translate to anywhere else. Well, and, and nothing better illustrates that than uh, our relationship with our children. And yeah. you so uh, adeptly illustrate that with the character of Henry. Mm -hmm. Um, who is uh, Lane's son, and uh, he has stopped talking 
mm-hmm. and stopped speaking to everyone but her. And what a great way to illustrate um, Lane's feelings of inadequacy in right. her own personal life than with the the person she's charged with, you know, raising and protecting and and all of this. How how did the the character of Henry did was that just a natural evolution out of thinking? You know what? What would Lane's life look like? To uh, uh, you know, ways of making her feel inadequate uh, to the rest of the world. Did, was Henry just a natural evolution of the character? When I conceived of him, I knew that that Lane had a son, and that there was something. I, I you know it was just like, okay, what is there's something that's different about her son, and I I can't even explain where the selective mutism idea came from, but it instantly felt right. And, and then that kind of grabbed a lot of the, uh, of my interest and curiosity and the oxygen of, uh, during the writing, because, uh, to have a really vulnerable child <clears throat> and to be a person who doesn't even realize how vulnerable they are themselves. I, I was just really interested in that relationship and no matter Lane changes a lot in the novel and learns a lot about herself. But the one thing that's a constant throughout the book is that feeling she has that you described in such a lovely way. She is just so devoted to this child and so conscious of needing to protect him, though she doesn't always know what that is going to entail. Nancy, when when a new story idea starts uh, you know, coming to life for you, um, what's that first kernel of the story that comes? Is it a character? Is it like the character of Lane? And, and you know, what, what would an advice columnist really be like in real life? Or is it um, is it a plot situation? Um, what's that first inkling of a story that starts to grow? How does that usually come to you? It, it almost always starts with something I'm curious about uh, and proceeds from there. So so for Sisters 1, 2, 3, I was, I was really curious about uh, a mother who is extremely anxious and worried uh, has what kind of effect on her kids, on her kid, because she has one kid. So that, that was kind of my entry in there. The, the, the thing that has happened before, before and happened with this novel is that the thing that I'm curious about does not, or, the, or that I think I'm curious about, does not always end up to be the thing that the novel is about. So uh, this novel, Rules for Moving, started out actually, I was really curious about the idea of infidelity, really serious, uh, damaging lies that happen in a marriage and infidelity in a marriage. And uh, I became interested in that because of a couple of stories that I heard. And I just really wanted to understand how does that happen that people keep these secrets from each other in a marriage? And, but as I began to explore that and then Lane was there and then Henry was there, I, I just became much more interested in them. And I do, uh, write in the first draft for sure, totally led by my instinct. I'm deep in my subconscious and I allow myself to go toward what interests me. And that sometimes means uh, moving away from what I thought interested me. So the, uh, the infidelity part of that very first idea is basically now in one letter. It's in a Dear Roxy letter in the middle of the novel. It kind of all got distilled into one of the Dear Roxy letters, Ask Roxy letters. And other than that, it almost was completely edited out by the end. Which sounds really odd, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, you, you uh, talked about writing um, from your subconscious in, mm-hmm. in that first draft. Did, does that mean you're a discovery writer? Are you discovering the story as you go, or are you working from a master plan from the beginning? I am the former. I am discovering as I go, and I I have a feeling that. I mean, I always wanted to be the other kind of writer. I just think that it's it's really inefficient how I write and those of us who write that way. But I have no other way to write. I write, I think through my hands. I can also think when I'm walking, but that's it. I think through my hands. So in that first draft, I am just, as I said, following my curiosity and going toward what interests me. And um, I think many people who write that way do feel like some of the surprise that we experience in the writing ends up for the reader to experience in the reading. Uh, but whatever works, right? If you're, if you are a, a person who can plan, has a master plan, 
that's how you have to write. And if you're a person who writes from deep within your subconscious, you can fight against it, but that's how you have to write too. But you know, I, I do enormous revising because of that, because in the, at the end, I really want the novel to read as if every single word was planned. And so everything, everything that is in the novel at the end is, is, has some meaning, some reason to be there. So that means throwing out so much stuff. (laughs) <laughs> I'm just like throw it out. <laughs> just throw it out. <laughs> throw it out. Uh, do you do you have an idea of the ending from the beginning? Are you writing towards something, or it, is it just you know the flashlight is illuminating six feet in front of you? If I'm lucky, it's six feet. You know, yeah. <laughs> I I do love that. I love that idea of like driving at night. You know, the yeah. headlight showing you as you go and you just can't go too fast because you might go into a tree and you're, you're you could easily get lost and then you just backtrack and try another road and that's exactly what it feels like and uh i'm not that comfortable with not knowing things in my regular life so i don't even know how i managed to develop that kind of way to write <laughs> because it's very uncomfortable I, I, have i wasted a day, a week, a year, a draft, you just don't know until at some point it just crystallizes and then it's very exciting. Well, whatever you do, don't change your process. Oh, it's so it's amazing. Fine. Thank yeah. you. The the book yeah. Rules for Moving is available available everywhere now. Um in Kindle edition, in audiobook edition, in uh, paperback. Um Nancy, I love this book. I'm recommending it recommending it to everyone. I can't talk today. No, um but- and um, there's links to it in the show notes of this episode. Um, if people are just discovering you and, and want to connect with all the great stuff that you do, where can they find you online? Uh, Nancy Star author website. There is a Nancy Star who is someone else. So that's her. So we have to add author to everything. Nancy Star author on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. And Hank, it's been so great to talk to you. We're going to send everyone to see you, Nancy. It's been a Thank pleasure you. for me as well. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web.